I first heard this saying at age 25, when an early career mentor gave me sage advice in an attempt to diffuse my anger. He succeeded, and a few weeks later, looking back on the incident, I realized that it really was a minor incident. This advice stayed with me, and many times after that, when I felt attacked, I found comfort in these words. In fact, I began to use it as a kind of refuge, often convincing myself that I was behaving like a mature professional, letting go of a grudge, be it perceived or real. I met my wife, Mary Helen, whom I simply call Helen, when I was 27 and she was 25. We quickly hit it off, discovering that we had similar tastes and opinions on many issues. It helped that she was a very attractive young woman, appropriate to most of my preferences. She was quite tall at 5 feet 8 inches and slender with long, shapely legs ending in perfectly toned buttocks. In addition, she had jet black hair, dark brown eyes and full, luscious lips. She also had a sweet, mischievous smile that always disarmed me, just like I think she liked the way I looked. She was always quick to say that she liked bigger men, and at six feet tall and 190 pounds, I certainly fit that description. However, I considered myself rather strong than beautiful, and was quite pleased that she was the beauty in our family. Our relationship is fast outgrowing the serious stage because I think we were both ready for a settled life. So 13 months after we first met, we stood at the altar of the Catholic Church, saying our vows. The next seven years flew by and we had two wonderful children, son Greg and daughter Sally. Everything seemed almost perfect and in addition to success in my family life, my career was also taking off. I left the corporate world two years after our wedding and, with Helen's full support, started my own business. Surprisingly, it was successful from the start and we were now living quite well. In fact, we lived better than well, which allowed my wife to quit her job and focus on her family. In addition, she was active in church and volunteer working for several non-profit organizations for fun. Our success also allowed us to acquire nice things, and over the course of our marriage, we went from our first apartment, through a starter home, to the large home we now enjoy living in. Everything was almost perfect, and looking back, I realized that I should have appreciated more how well everything worked out for us. I first met J.D. Thornton at a client event. They were hosting a reception for key suppliers, and we were introduced by the vice president of purchasing. We talked briefly, and I realized that he is not a competitor, but at the same time he is very self-confident. It was almost comical to listen to him, and several times, looking at the client, I noticed his wink, letting me know that he thought the same. Several months passed after that, and I had completely forgotten about him, when one day I received a call from him on my mobile. Hey, this is J.D. Thornton. Remember we met a while ago, he shouted, quickly recalling our short conversation. Hello, how can I help you? I asked wanting to quickly get to the point. I was wondering if you could meet for lunch. I have a business idea that I would like to discuss. I think it will be beneficial for both of us, he explained. Reluctantly, I agreed, and the following week we met at a small diner. We had just sat down when he received a call and quickly found himself in the middle of a loud conversation. Although it was annoying, it gave me something to appreciate. I guessed that J.D. was about 40 years old. He looked a couple of inches taller than me, although he was slimmer, almost wiry. He had a ruddy face and short brown hair. He was dressed in jeans and a simple button-down shirt with ostentatious reptile cowboy boots. Overall, he seemed like a man who was more focused on business than appearance. Sorry about that, he muttered, ending the call a couple of minutes later. Yeah, no big deal, I replied and continued. What do you mean? Let's order first. I'm dying of hunger, he replied. He called the waitress, and when she left we chatted on random topics until our food arrived. Only when we had almost finished eating did he bring up the topic of the meeting. Listen, I think between our two companies we have opportunities to change suppliers for the Neptune product line. You have a reliable supply chain for technical components, and my manufacturers in Mexico can very cheaply deliver structural elements. I think we should come together and see what we can do, he explained. Surprisingly, his idea made sense, and I sat up straight, realizing the potential. 
We spent another hour discussing the concept and then agreed to meet the following week for an in-depth conversation. Over the next few days, I collected information in preparation and also made rough estimates. Calculations potential of the idea. Conservatively, this could increase revenue for my business by 30%, and the best thing is that it could be done with almost no investment. The meeting the following week went well, and we drew up a preliminary plan for the new venture, including a business structure. We talked about approaching the client and presenting our plan, but JD insisted on waiting until we let's develop him further. We agreed that the next step would be a thorough review of the supply chain, so once we were done, I set up meetings with key suppliers. Over the next month we met with them, and although I thought it would be wise to visit his manufacturers in Mexico, JD wanted to wait until we had completed the technical check. So far everything had gone extremely well, and my enthusiasm was obvious to Helen. I held back from telling her about the opportunity until she had no more reason to, but in the end I was forced to do so. What made you so happy? she asked, then added, you've been fluttering around for weeks. I started laughing at her description and then explained, I'm working on a new business idea that I think will be very good. It should bring us a lot of money. Don't we have enough money? she asked, although I knew it was partly teasing. It's expensive to keep you beautiful, I said, instantly realizing that I had chosen the wrong words. Oh, really? she answered, raising her left eyebrow. Sorry, that didn't sound right, I replied. I hope so, she said, pretending to be offended. Later that night, once the kids had gone to bed, I followed her like a hound until I had her to the bedroom. She giggled and we got busy. Not bad, I whispered as we hugged. You're so proud of yourself. I think this business makes you horny, she replied. You make me lusty, and this business is for the sake of the family, I answered. Honey, if this works, maybe we can donate something to the church, she whispered, snuggling closer. Helen's kind soul was one of the things I loved so much about her. This wasn't the first time she made it clear that she had what she needed and wanted to help others. Of course, her work in church and non-profit organizations played a role, but I knew that it was also part of who she was. Even without these influences, I think she would have made a similar request. We'll see, I replied, hugging her tightly. I was not by nature an optimist or enthusiast when it came to business, as experience had taught me that it was better to be reasonable and remain calm. However, with this new venture, I broke that rule. There was a lightness in my step, an excitement in my daily activities, and a smile on my face that I couldn't remove. That's why I didn't immediately realize something was wrong when JD suddenly stopped communicating. I tried to contact him by phone and email for almost a week when I realized something was wrong. While speaking with one of my longtime suppliers, a harsh reality suddenly became clear. Hey, I thought you and JD were working together on the Neptune project, asked Ron, the technical manager at the supplier, at the end of a conversation on a different topic. We're working. I replied, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Okay, well, you should probably check this out, he said, clearly uncomfortable, before adding, call Samantha. Sam, or Samantha, was the senior woman in charge of contracts at the company, and as soon as I finished talking to Ron, I immediately dialed her number. Sam, what's going on? I asked after the usual greetings. This is confidential. She began, but no doubt remembering the years we had known each other, she continued, this guy, JD, said he would work alone. Now everything has become completely clear. JD Thornton used me, manipulated me to gain knowledge of the supply chain, and once learned, decided to throw me out of business. It was a dirty trick, but after thinking about it, I realized that I shouldn't be surprised. My initial thoughts about him were not positive, but I allowed my interest in the deal and my desire for money to overtake my concerns. It took more than two weeks to get the full picture, and during this time I learned that he had contacted all my suppliers and even made a presentation to the client. I was seething with anger, realizing that all this was done behind my back with obvious malicious intent. Hey, buddy, JD said into the phone with dismissive arrogance. It took more than two weeks for him to respond, 
and I suspected he felt he had everything under control now, and I was no longer a threat. This way he could enjoy the victory while laughing at me at the same time. JD, I just want to hear from you what the hell you're up to, I said. What am I planning? I thought that I had just deceived a fool, he answered and began to laugh loudly. I had rehearsed in my head several times how our conversation would go when we finally connected, but nothing prepared me for such a message. I expected him to be evasive, most likely dismissive, but not angry. This stunned me, and I had difficulty finding the words to respond. You know, don't you think this is wrong? I asked, immediately feeling the inadequacy of this statement. Wrong? Crap takes it from me. I don't care what's wrong. I'm going to make a lot of money, he replied, and then hung up. Numb, frenzied, angry thousands of feelings engulfed my body in the next few days, like on a Ferris wheel, experiencing an endless cycle. Then, very slowly, one thought began to separate from the other's revenge. I wanted to hit JD and make him feel the deep humiliation that I felt, and looking back, the desire was so strong that it overshadowed all rationality. Surprisingly, I was able to put my emotions aside while I hatched my revenge plan and developed a very deliberate attack strategy. My initial plan was to contact two suppliers that I knew were important to the deal and use my long-term relationships to try to convince them to give up JD. Then I intended to strike back. His business wasn't all that unique, so I hoped that with some effort I could find others that would at least threaten his customer base. Carl Westbrook was the owner of the main supplier company, and I knew him for almost ten years. He was in his seventies and one of those men who would probably die within weeks of retirement. Although our relationship had always been positive, I wasn't sure what to expect. Sitting in his office, I explained the situation in detail, holding nothing back, while he sat back in his chair and listened intently. Okay, what else do you have? he asked when I finished. His answer puzzled me, so I asked, What do you mean, Carl? Screw him, that's what I mean. I'm too old to work with bastards, he replied, then after a pause leaned across the table and continued, How long have I known you? Ten years? During all this time, you have always been straightforward and honest. Do you know how rare that is? Thank you, Carl, I replied, feeling my chest tighten with emotion. Fuck him. He's an asshole he repeated. With the second supplier, everything was not so simple, and I had to put in a lot of effort. However, I was eventually able to persuade them to end their relationship with JD. I had to promise that I would do my best to compensate for the volume, which they were losing, but if my plan worked, I knew it wouldn't be a problem. I was pleasantly surprised by the success of the first stage of his plan. I thought it would take longer, require more convincing, but it seemed to be certain that I disliked JD, which helped. Feeling good, I convinced Helen to let the kids go to their grandparents for the night so we could be together. After a nice, expensive dinner, we curled up in bed, just talking and hugging. What happened to your new venture? She asked. I deliberately hid the drama from her, but I couldn't hide my loss of enthusiasm, so I was a little surprised that she only just started asking questions. It hit a snag, I replied, deliberately avoiding details because I knew she would not understand or support my methods. And I've already spent all the money you promised, she teased. Patience, dear, I replied, tickling her ribs. My touch made her squirm and giggle, and when she finally calmed down, she said, I'd still like to do something for the church. The next part of my plan required much more effort. For a month, she consumed all my free time, even Helen noticed my absence from family life. I was able to find two companies that could compete with JD and had similar, if not better, cost structures. I used my contacts with the client to establish them as suppliers, knowing that this would, at a minimum, have a negative impact on JD prices. In addition, through my efforts, I realized that one of the companies would be an excellent supplier to replace JD as part of the Neptune project if I decided to renew this initiative. If the client had any suspicions about my actions, they did not appear, and they seemed happy with the expansion of the supplier base. Surprisingly, contrary to my expectations, JD did not react in any way to my actions to disrupt deliveries. 
Then I found out that the companies I entered had been asked to bid for some competitive work, and I was sure I would hear from him soon. I even prepared and rehearsed a message that I intended to convey to him in order to humiliate him the same way he humiliated me. However, everything remained quiet, and after almost six months the situation began to fade from my thoughts. When planning revenge, first dig two graves. There should be accompanying advice. If you cannot follow this, at least do not take revenge on someone who is eviler than you. Unfortunately, the comfort I found in J.D.'s silence was soon shattered, and I learned that I had used conventional weapons while he had gone for complete thermonuclear destruction. Hey boss, we need to talk, J.D. said over the phone. I got his number so I was prepared and responded, J.D., how's business going? Oh, you know, ups and downs, he said, then added, seriously, let's meet. J.D., I have absolutely no desire to ever see you again. I guess it ended the way it was supposed to, and I'm moving on, I replied, pleased with his apologetic tone and my own controlled voice. Boy, believe me, you will want to come to me, he said, switching to a condescending tone. No, I'm fine, I replied and hung up. After that, I continued my day, giggling to myself several times at my victory over the smug ass. I was about to head home when I noticed a letter from J.D., and when I opened it, I was stunned to see a photo of my wife attached. Helen had her back to the camera, but was partially turned so that the side of her face was visible. No doubt it was her, but what made this photo shocking was that she was only wearing black panties. The side of one of her breasts was visible, and if it had been any other woman, I would have found the photo sensual and slightly erotic. However, it was not any other woman, it was my wife. My first reaction was to call the police as somehow J.D. had managed to break into our home. But upon closer inspection, I realized that Helen was not at our home. I didn't recognize any of the furniture or the color of the walls, which left me confused as to what I was seeing. Slowly, however, reality began to sink in, and knowing that it came from J.D., I suddenly felt like it must be ominous. Several times I reached for the keyboard, but each time I retreated. I needed to know more, gather more information somehow, and think through my thoughts before responding. For this reason, I simply turned off the computer and went home. On the way, my thoughts turned to my wife's involvement, and I hoped that she would rush into my arms and explain everything. However, when I walked through the door, both the wife and children acted as if it was a normal day. My wife was all smiles, and my kids climbed onto my lap after dinner while we watched a movie. Later, after she had cleaned up the kitchen, Helen joined us with a glass of wine and continued her usual conversation about what had happened that day. However, while she spoke, my mind did not let go of the image of her in the photo. What else was going on? I asked when the conversation reached a lull. Although it was a crude attempt, I tried to give her the opportunity to confess and explain everything. She didn't take advantage of this, and all she did was start talking about her charitable causes again. I tried again after the kids went to bed, but that attempt was also unsuccessful. Apparently my beautiful wife was able to keep her secret to herself while continuing to act in her normal family manner. In fact, her demeanor was so relaxed that I began to wonder if he had digitally doctored her into this photo. I didn't contact J.D. the next day because I just didn't want to please the bastard. However, the next morning I could not resist, and with trembling hands I dialed his number. Well, damn it. Look who called. Can you imagine? He laughed. Where did you get this? I asked, not knowing what else to say. Oh, I have a lot more than that. A lot more, he replied, laughing again. What the hell have you done, you fucking bastard? I screamed into the phone, unable to hold back any longer. I fucked you. Hard. You wanted to play games and you lost, he replied, no longer laughing, and then after a second of silence he continued, Now, unless you want your life exposed to the world, be here at 3 p.m. today. I was shaking as I put the phone down and, contemplating the dilemma, realized that I had a choice. Either confront Helen or go to J.D. and find out more. Since I was still confused, I decided to attend the meeting that afternoon. At 3.05 p.m., I opened the door to J.D.'s office and upon entering, 
I was immediately escorted into a large conference room by a young secretary. I waited nervously for ten minutes before J.D. and two other men entered. One of them was a large black man, over six feet tall, and after taking a position behind me, J.D. and the other man sat down opposite me. Damn, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes, J.D. laughed, then continued, That's Conrad behind you. He's here to keep you from doing anything stupid. And this is Don, you will soon find out about him. What does all of this mean? I asked, needing to say something. You know what it is, or you can guess, J.D. replied, then picked up the remote, pressed a button and said, I think we'll start with this. The screen on the far wall blinked, and then the video began. Instantly, every muscle in my body tensed as I saw Helen in Don's arms. She was wearing only panties, which I recognized from the photo he sent, and her arm was wrapped around his neck. Then J.D. pressed pause. Your wife is a beautiful woman, I was surprised, he said, looking at me for a moment before starting the video again. I was stunned. Watch how this big guy pleases Helen, he said, and for some reason the use of her name really annoyed me. I felt my body tense up and despite what I had just seen, I couldn't accept it and thought it had to be forced or staged. I just couldn't imagine Helen cheating. As if sensing my condition, Conrad's hands fell on my shoulders and his strength was evident through his touch. I saw J.D. look at Don quickly, then smile at me and say, Make yourself comfortable. There's a lot more to come, he laughed. What the hell is this? What did you do to her? How did you get her to do this? I blurted out, unable to contain myself any longer. My statement made Conrad squeeze my shoulders, and again J.D. looked at him for a moment before answering. She did it herself. I'll explain everything later, but let's watch the movie. He's damn good. Hell, I could probably sell it. I was still looking at the couple on the screen when Don spoke for the first time. She's one of the best I've ever had. That says a lot because he had a lot, J.D. added, laughing at me again. My God, J.D., you're a crazy bastard, I said, shaking my head. My comment made him laugh deeply, and then he said, You should probably know the details. Let me start by saying that you did a good job of throwing a spanner in the works for me on the Neptune project. I was surprised because I didn't think you could do it. But you should have understood that I won't just leave it like that. It was your mistake, and it was a big one. Or what led to his wife being a cheater. Don interjected, unsuccessfully trying to be funny. After a quick glance at the man next to him, J.D. began again. Anyway, I needed revenge. It's just my personality, and after doing some digging into your life, figuring out how to get to you through your wife seemed logical. Plus, it was fun, much better than some business stuff. Helen is not like that. What did you do with her? He challenged him again, unable to accept her behavior. Like I said, we didn't do anything. Well, that is, except for seducing her, which Don succeeded in here. I think you'll agree with that, he laughed, causing the others to laugh. And when they stopped, he continued, I got in touch with Don through some mutual friends. He has a reputation in certain circles for using his looks and charm to get women to do things. So I hired him and put him in a rented house that was full of hidden cameras. I think the quality of the video confirms this. You sick bastard, I said as he paused for effect. J.D. laughed out loud while Don and Conrad chuckled and said, You're probably right, but let me finish the story. You see, Don is really good, and besides getting him into the house, we gave him information about Helen. It was his idea to reach her through the church. She thinks he is a lonely businessman who is interested in all things Catholic. Like J.D. said, she was a damn good woman. I was surprised, Don added with a grin. I was surprised by his statement, since Helen had always been reserved. Now what Don did, the way he pulled it off, was he started going to church and getting to know your wife's routine. He started going to these everyday meetings and struck up a friendship with her. It took him three weeks to talk her into coffee, and a week later they were kissing in the parking lot. Then little Helen had a nervous breakdown which she had to overcome, but she came back and agreed to go to his house for a drink. J.D. described, laughing at the end. An easy target, Don added. 
Did you know your wife is so promiscuous? J.D. said, practically giggling. It was a shocking revelation, and even though I knew I looked weak, I couldn't help but ask, how many times? How many times has this happened, Dawn? asked my enemy. About twenty, he replied with a grin. When J.D. saw the shock on my face, he added, well, it's been a couple of months. I fought to hold back tears as I looked down at the table and thought about it all. It was such a sudden act of destroying the marriage that I had enjoyed and fought so hard for. And there was also the question of our children. How will they react to divorce? I wished there was some explanation. I desperately wanted Helen to have some reason, some story that would at least give me hope. But deep down I knew there was too much incriminating evidence. What do you want? I finally said, completely amazed. As soon as I said those words, I saw J.D. His expression changed. Now he looked sullen, and slowly nodding his head, he began. What do I want? I do not want anything. I beat you, bastard. You tried to play with me, and I destroyed you. I won. Then why the hell am I here? I blurted out angrily. You're here so I can see the look on your damn face, he replied and then took a deep breath and continued, But now that you know I won, I have an offer for you. Which, I asked, fearing the worst. I have enough video of your wife to ruin her and embarrass you and your entire family. Obviously the church won't be happy. Now, I'm ready to exchange all the materials for your business, he explained. Go to hell, I replied. I would understand if you said no. Of course, this probably means divorce, especially when all the material comes out. But who could blame you? She turned out to be so easily accessible. It will be unpleasant, and your children will learn the truth when they grow up. Besides, you'll look like a loser who couldn't keep his woman, he mimicked. And when I didn't respond, he continued, Now, if you see it from my side, at least you'll come out with dignity. Sure, losing your business sucks, but you can start again. J.D., you are the craziest person I have ever known. What if I go to the police? I threatened. You won't go to the police. Now, think about it tonight and be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. with the answer, he replied, and with his words, I felt Conrad's hands leave my shoulders. My hands were shaking so much that it was difficult to drive, and all the way home I was thinking about what to say to my wife when I came face to face with her. I knew I had to control my anger as violence would only create a deeper hole, but I really had no idea what to say or how to react. I sat in the car in the driveway for fifteen minutes before I could muster up the courage to go into the house. Hi, honey, my wife called as I walked into the kitchen, and as I looked across the dining room, I saw our kids watching cartoons. She leaned in for a kiss, and I mechanically kissed her on the cheek. Feeling that something was wrong, she asked, is everything okay? Yeah, well, we need to talk after dinner, I said, and for a moment I saw panic in her eyes. Okay, she replied and turned back to the stove. Helen took a long time to put the children to bed, which made me wonder if she had any idea what the conversation would be about. Finally, after I was sure the kids were asleep, I nodded for her to join me and together we moved to the couch in the living room. Listen, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Are you cheating? I asked. No, of course not. Why are you asking such a thing? She answered, but in her eyes I saw guilt. Helen, who is Dawn? I said. Suddenly, the guilt in her eyes gave way to panic. Where are you from? Listen, I can explain. Go ahead, I said as calmly as possible when she fell silent. I'm sorry. She said after several unsuccessful attempts to speak and began to sob. I let her cry until she began to regain control, then asked, Tell me what happened. I, I met him at church, and I don't know. We recognized each other, and it just happened, she said. You slept with him, I clarified, and she nodded, so I continued. How long has this been going on? For a while, maybe a month, she replied, shrinking the time frame J.D. had described. How many times? I whispered. Several seconds of silence passed before she whispered back, too much. You love him? I forced myself to ask, not knowing which answer was better. No, no, she answered instantly. No more, Helen, 
I said and began to rise, suddenly feeling tired. How do you know? She called behind me. I just knew, I said. Driving to JD's the next morning was the hardest thing I've ever done. I decided to sign a waiver for the business, deciding that disclosing everything to the public didn't make sense. If I was going to divorce Helen, I would prefer to do it quietly. However, I was very concerned about my employees. Many of them were with me from the beginning, and I had no confidence that JD would treat them fairly. What's the answer? He asked, bypassing the formalities as he rudely entered the conference room with Conrad right behind him. I'll give you the business, but I want all the materials, everything, I told him. I thought you'd say so, that's why it's all in the box, he said, nodding toward the container at the end of the table, then adding, I don't need it, I've seen enough of this anyway. He then handed me the document, and although I knew I probably should have consulted a lawyer, I just wanted to get it over with. After a quick scan, I saw that he had framed the deal as a payment of income that I knew would never come, but which provided him with a tax advantage. I signed it, then handed the document back. JD smiled at me, and I was about to leave when he said, Before you go, take the disc marked hash 34 and watch it. The machine is easy to use. He gave him an angry look as he walked out, closing the door behind him. Despite the feeling of manipulation, I took the indicated disc from the box and inserted it into the tray. It took a few minutes to figure out the remote control, but finally the screen lit up and instantly switched to the stage. Seconds later the video ended, and I realized that JD had edited it specifically for me. It was a dirty move, although I shouldn't have been surprised because he was truly a disgusting person. I collected the disc, put it in the box, and headed towards the exit finding J.D. standing just outside the door. Damn, she wanted it, he laughed. Fuck you, J.D., I said and walked past him. By the way, buddy, she's already called Don twice this morning, he announced loudly, and I noticed several people sitting in the cubes looking up. We agreed that it's over, I replied immediately. I can't control your wife, and Don doesn't work for me anymore, he laughed. I was seething with anger when I walked into the office to announce the change, and it took several hours of meetings and explanations before I could finally leave. When I finally returned home, Helen was watching TV with the children, and her nervous behavior left me wondering whether I still had a wife. I told her that I thought it would be better if she and the children went to her parents for the night, since we had a lot of serious conversations, and she quickly agreed. An hour later she returned and joined me in the living room. I had already loaded the disc into the player, so with a simple press of the remote, the TV turned on with a scene of her and Don discussing the pregnancy. Oh my God, oh my God, how? She began, recognizing the meeting. Helen, are you pregnant? I asked, ignoring her words. No, no, I don't know, she answered. When does your next cycle start? I asked. Sunday, I think she replied. And you were with him and me, so you could be pregnant, I said. Yes, she answered quietly. Give me your phone, I demanded. After working with the screens, I got to recent calls and saw that five connections were made that day. Is this his number? I asked. Yes, she said, her voice barely above a whisper, and I noticed her body begin to tremble. Did you sleep with him today? I asked. I had never used this kind of language with Helen before, but I no longer felt like a caring, respectful husband. No, she answered decisively, as if this somehow justified her dissolute actions. Why were you talking to him? I... I wanted to know what was going on, she replied. Did it take five calls? I asked, and then continued, What else were you talking about? I... I don't know, just about this, she answered nervously. Is it true? Have you asked him if he loves you? You didn't tell him that you were in love with him? You didn't ask him about his illegitimate child? I blurted out quickly. I remembered the intimacy she showed in the recordings and knew that for her their connection was more than just sex. The look she gave me made it clear that I was right and some or all of the things I mentioned had been discussed. I, I, I'm sorry, was all she could get out. Let me tell you what happened, I began but stopped so she could wipe her eyes, then continued as calmly as possible. 
Remember that business I worked on a few months ago? So, I worked on it with a guy named J.D. Thornton. He tried to deceive me, and when I realized this, I did several things to take revenge. He couldn't handle what I gave him back, so he hired your boyfriend Don to seduce you as revenge on me. Don doesn't give a damn about you. They deliberately tried to destroy our lives. Oh God, my God, no, Helen moaned. Yeah, and I saw it all. All the videos they made and them laughing at how easy you were, I explained. No, oh no, no. She sobbed, but in her words I wasn't sure whether her emotions were directed at me or at Don. I left her on the couch with her head in her hands and went to make myself a drink. Just as I was pouring the bourbon I heard her moving, and when I returned she had disappeared into the back of the house. A few minutes later she appeared, dressed to go out, and I instinctively knew where she was going. You go to him, I challenged her. I, I have to check on the kids, she said, although we both knew it was a lie. She didn't return until the next morning, and I never tried to call her or challenge her when she returned. I was too emotionally drained, and even though I knew we were probably done, we continued for the next few days without further discussion. Our interactions were tense, and to cope with the awkwardness, most of our attention was directed to the children. A week had passed since our conversation when I received a message from JD with a link attached. As soon as I opened it, I realized it was a video, so I paused it, then emailed it to myself so I could open it on my desktop computer. The scene started with her in Don's arms, sobbing uncontrollably. She was dressed in the same clothes she had worn that evening when she left to check on the kids, so it seemed like she had gone straight to her lover. Baby, calm down, Don's voice said. Why did you do it? Helen blurted out. Don't worry. Everything is fine, he answered evasively. Don't leave me. What if I... She began, but stopped mid-sentence. You are pregnant? he answered quickly, with a smile on his face. I don't know, maybe, she said. The video was edited to suddenly show the two of them on a bed. Seconds later, I watched in amazement as a naked JD walked into frame. In the video fade to black, but came back on a few seconds later, showing JD sitting at his office desk. Hey, buddy, sorry for sleeping with your wife, but Don praised her so much that I just had to try it myself he said and began to laugh, which lasted for several seconds before he spoke again. I took your business, your wife, ruined your marriage, and, who knows, maybe even got her pregnant. I beat you, bastard, on all fronts. But look on the bright side if you decide to stay with her. At least now she knows what good sex is. I moved in a few days later, not even bothering to tell Helen I had seen the last video. There was no point in doing this, as it simply added to the pain that was already there. Dawn stopped all contact with her, which sent her into depression, and she even went to Las Vegas to try to keep him, but after a few weeks, she finally woke up to reality and returned. Miraculously, she didn't get pregnant, which was a relief, although part of me thought it would only be fair if she ended up with a baby from one of them. Of course, her parents tried to contact me several times, as did the priest from the church, begging me to forgive her and think about the family. They knew her transgressions were significant, although they probably did not understand the depth of her depravity. I stood my ground, giving no hint of hope, and finally the calls stopped. Now I devote most of my time to rebuilding the business. With a pending divorce, money is very limited, which has forced me to live in tight quarters, but I have made some progress. Luckily, I have maintained good relationships with clients and JD seems to be deliberately trying to irritate them. It will take time, but I am confident that the business will improve. Due to child-related matters, I see Helen at least once a week, and almost every time she asks us to sit down and talk. On several occasions, she even tried to seduce me, even though I made it clear that this was impossible. I could forgive her for having sex, although it would be difficult but it was obvious that she was ready to leave me for Dawn, and that is something I cannot forget. So much change, so quickly, has been very difficult to accept, and I seem to be living in an emotional roller coaster world. Unfortunately, a small voice in my head continues to whisper that this all started because of my desire for revenge, 
and that my wife was an innocent victim of these events. So remember the prophetic words of wisdom when planning revenge, dig two graves first. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.